This is a view from the bunker. Now, here's Derek Gilbert. From a gangster on the streets of L.A. to preaching the gospel. That is our program this week. Welcome to A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. Joining us is a gentleman that uh, I've known for about nine years now. And um, as we were talking before the program, uh, and as I've read, been reading his new book, My Crazy Life, it is very clear that we've walked different paths. But here we are side by side, not just on screen, but side by side in ministry, proclaiming the gospel of Jesus Christ and sharing the hope that we have in our Lord and Savior. And I hope over the course of this uh, conversation it will become clear to you that none of us, regardless of where we start, is beyond redemption, beyond his reach, or um, excluded from the joy of his salvation. He is, uh, you know, I forgot to write down your title, Mondo, uh, exec- <laughs> executive producer and co-host of the Jim Baker Show. Uh, would that be uh, Would that be accurate? Mondo de la Vega, welcome to the bunker. Listen, I'm just honored I get to be your friend. I think uh, that... When I look at titles, I look at opportunities that life grants you. But Derek, honestly, I'm just the next gang member that fell in love with God, the next gang member that is honored just to be invited to sit at the table with men like you. Because at one point in my life, I didn't feel good enough to even be talked to, be invited to anything. And the fact that I'm able to be here with you and you call me a friend, for me, that's a great honor. So being a friend to you is all the title that I need. And I say that <laughs> respectfully, humbly, because the moments that life creates, uh, they created a beautiful opportunity to meet people like you that maybe we don't have anything in common other than the fact that we fell in love with God and God restored us and God gave us a second chance. And therefore, we're here today. Yeah, it is. Um, uh <sighs> Well, again, just a testament to the miracle of his grace that uh, he can bring people from all walks of life. It's like what Paul said, you know, uh, in the body of Christ, there's neither Jew nor Greek, slave nor free, male nor female, for we are all one in Christ Jesus. And that's, uh, I think, an example here. I mean, reading your story and how, and we'll we'll get into this in just a minute, but uh, again, as a gangster on the streets of L.A., you know, I grew up in Chicago. So, you know, we would see the gang signs around, you know, the vice lords, the disciples, the Latin kings. But my parents protected my sister and me from all of that. And besides, I was the the smart, fat kid with glasses, <laughs> asthma, and flat feet. I was not exactly prime gang material. Oh boy! So, uh, so it was it was a very different upbringing. Um, there was that feeling of exclusion, but it was for completely different reasons than than you felt when you got to the United States. But you know, let's get into that. I, I did not know your early story, starting yeah. out in Central America, and. Um, like far too many in this world, a uh, product of a, of a broken home. How how did you get from, is it Guatemala, correct? Yeah. Guatemala yeah. to uh, Los Angeles. You know, what's interesting is that life in Central America was beautiful, was perfect. We had a family unity. We got together every single day. We ate together. We hung out together. My father was my hero. You know, the interesting part about it, Derek, is that my father never raised his voice that way. He never screamed at me. He never beat me. He never uh, anything of of that nature. Yet when I saw the ugly part of my father that he protected from me, seeing uh, destroyed me because it happened in my own home. And it happened to the fact that he took it out on my mother Mm. and almost beat my mother to death with the same broom that my mother had used for years to clean our home. Yet that broom became the very weapon that almost killed her. And the words that were coming out of my father, the frustration, the the demons that my father fought from uh, as a little boy, uh, literally changed my life forever. It changed the way I felt about him and it changed my emotions towards him. And it was the birth of hatred. It was the birth of insecurities because I never imagined that my hero would turn on me, would turn on my mother. But as I wrote this book, I began to find out that my father was dealing with a lot of issues of his own, that he protected my sister and I. Yet at that very moment, you know, I I, I write in my book, I used to believe life can change in 24 hours. And I used to preach all over the world about life can change in 24 hours. 
But after writing this book and discovering the reality that life can change in a matter of, of seconds. And seconds, you lose your family. And seconds, you can lose a business. And seconds, you lose your identity. And that was the birth of trying to find who I was. And my mother was born in Los Angeles, California. She was a U.S. citizen already, went back to Guatemala uh, and went to school there, private school, and fell in love with my father. Yet she fell in love with a man she never knew, a man that hid is true emotions, and my mother was captive in her own home. Hmm. We were not allowed to call mom, mom. You know, I called my mother uh, by her middle name. She was not even worthy of even being called by her first name. Wow. And I explained my, in my book that I didn't realize that even at, at a, a six-year-old boy, I was already abusing my mother, and I didn't even realize it. I was wow. just following the footsteps of a man that I called my hero. And we ended up uh, escaping from there. That was the last time I would see my home. That will be the last time. And I go in detail in my book how everything happened. Mm -hmm. uh, but that will be the last time that my mother had enough. And by that time, it had been nine years that she had been beaten almost every single day, physically abused, verbally abused, and at times even sexually abused by my own father. Mm. You know, and my mother had enough. And sometimes fear cripples you from not making a move to escape the place that you're in. Yet my mother found the tenacity to find the will inside of her to walk away from everything that she had known up to that moment just to save not only her life, but her son and her daughter's life. Hmm. And my mother had to be faced with something very powerful because during that time, and you're a historian, and you will know that in the 80s, uh, the Americas came into one of the worst civil wars that Central America had faced at, up to that moment. Mm -hmm. So we were escaping not only the war inside of the home, but we were escaping the civil war all around us. And during that escape, I began to see things that a little boy should have never seen. So see death was around me. Uh, rapes were going around, destruction, and during uh, in the middle of that escape, uh, my heart began to get hardened in a way that I didn't understand because as a little kid, no one ever asked you any questions. They they just assume that you're okay. Yeah, and, and you're talking now a, a young boy of age of six at that time, right? That's correct. And, and here I'm developing as a little boy, being gifted with uh, the ability to play soccer. So all of my life was shaped around that. And my father knew that I was gifted. So I was being prepared to, you know, join the elite of, of the country's best of the best. Yet in the middle of all that, my whole world turned upside down. Mm. Everything that I had known was no longer the same. My mother said this, you have to forget where you come from. You have to forget the language. You have to forget the memories because we are about to enter into a new world where new memories are going to be made. Uh, a new identity is going to be created because what you used to know will no longer be. Well, that's a shock as a little boy because how do you put that into perspective? All you knew was the world that you knew every single day. And all of a sudden, we're fleeing from my father, the man that I thought – was supposed to bring protection and security and stability. Now we, we, are on, we are on the run for our lives. And I explained how my father had political influence and military influence and police influence. And my father was looking for us. Yeah, I didn't realize that my father was doing, uh, doing all that till later in life because the very last words I heard my father say was, I don't want them anymore. Mm. And that destroyed me. How, what did I do for my father not to want me? Yeah. Was it my fault? So I began to carry this guilt and anxiety and, and, and unforgiveness in my heart. And I told him, I told my father, when I grow up, if I ever find you, I'm going to kill you. Because here I was paralyzed watching my father beating my mother close to death, and I couldn't do anything. And if he was not going to protect her, then all I wanted to do was protect my mother from this sure. monster. Yet I felt paralyzed and not even able to even do anything. But the only thing I was able to speak out was death. 
And yeah. I spent my whole life, in my youth at least, chasing a ghost. And everyone I came in contact with, with was the image of my father. Hmm. I wanted to get even with him. But the funny thing is, you know, uh, Derek, as I watch a lot of my people, a lot of the Latinos come across this nation and by the thousands, they're, they're heading towards the border. Back then, it was a little bit different because the Civil War was going on, yet many of our people were making the same trip across the border, fleeing the same situations, if not worse, uh, that what we were going through. But my mother wanted to do it the right way. My mother couldn't afford to be raped in the middle of the process and lose her kids. Uh, my mother couldn't afford to do, uh, you know, keep us in hiding. She says, I don't want you guys to hide in another country. And yet the price you pay to do it the right way, uh, most of the time gets stuck in the line of bureaucracy, all the paperwork. And we spend another year on a, in a different nation waiting for the paperwork to go through, and we were getting denied, denied, denied. The powerful thing about this and my story, and, and this is the book, mm -hmm. uh, I detailed how the prophetic word was delivered twice towards my mother in the middle of our crisis. And so by a really unexpected like, source, too. I mean, uh, oh, somebody you never would have expected to meet. Never, never. And, and the thing about it is, God is always in the midst. It's just hard to find him when you're going through the process of, of, of breakdowns or nervous breakdowns and, and despair and, and, and fear. Yet my mother found herself in a church. This, is, this was a mega church in Central America. We had never been to a church of that magnitude, or let alone a charismatic church where people are prophesying interpretation of tongues. I didn't, we didn't have a clue what that was. Yet, in that prophecy, there must have been over 10,000 people there. No one knew us. We were not regular members. But the prophetic word was this, and I detail it in my book. There's a woman in this building with two kids. One is a boy, and God has his hand on that boy. And you, there's a little girl, and God has a calling for that little girl. He says, and God is going to guide you through your Egypt and get you to the promised land. And, and it said more. Mm -hmm. And then we find ourselves in a different nation waiting for the process to get accepted to uh, be citizens of the United States or let alone just the green card. You know, we didn't realize what, what was the outcome going to be. And my mother was losing hope because we were getting denied, denied, denied after thousands of dollars of process for paperwork to get, you know, to get an interview to even be looked at. My mom was losing hope. Well, in the middle of that, uh, someone pays for my mother, my sister, and I to go to this beautiful resort just to, you know, let the children not focus on the negative. And my mother was sitting by the pool, and a very famous Christian uh, pop singer walks in and prophesies the same word to my mother. My mother had never met this pop star. You know, famous people don't just hang out and talk like that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Unless there's a word from God. And the very next day, my mother gets a call from the uh, U.S. Embassy office, and they hand her, you know, three envelopes, one with her name, my sister's name, and my name, saying, welcome to the United States. Your son and your daughter are now U.S. citizens. So not just getting a visa, you actually full-blown United States citizens. Full-blown. Yeah, wow. And I can tell you that. I thought that was going to be the greatest moment of my life and the greatest miracle. Yet it was the beginning of the unraveling of my life because it prepared me to walk into America where the beginning of the explosion of gangsters that America was not prepared for took place in the late 80s and all the way through the 90s. Mm. This is a very interesting and i think um it's an aspect of a of a story that's affecting our entire nation our entire culture um and your mother god bless her from it really comes through in the pages worked as hard as humanly possible i mean every at last ounce of strength to provide for you and your sister laura but when you're in when you're a kid and you're growing up and you want to fit in with the people around you, 
it can be difficult for a single parent with without connections yeah. taking whatever job you can get just to keep a roof over your head it, yeah. it is very difficult for her to compete with the uh the outward appearance of success that you see from the gang members around you um how what what is the beginning of of that that story how did you get drawn into that life you know it's so interesting you said that because my mother had to get two or three jobs a week just to keep the food in the table give us a roof over our heads but the price you pay is that you're absent and the key that the gang life and the gang family provided was consistency and stability structure my mother was very unstable because as a single parent you have to work three or four jobs. Now you have to understand she did everything she could to be stable and to give us stability, but we lost that stability in the process of everything that unraveled in her life. And we were the ones paying the price for that now. Right. The one consistent portion of that story was the gangsters that were already set up in the neighborhood were giving kids like myself stability. My father was absent, so now you have a bunch of young men that can step in and be a father-like, be a mother-like, right? And by the time my mother figured out, I was already gone. Gone emotionally, I was there physically, but emotionally I was absent and gone already because I had given my soul to the gang that provided the stability, that the consistency, and that's what changed everything, that my first violence or act of violence that I saw was my father beat my mother with a broomstick. The second most uh, dangerous act of violence that I saw was now a baseball bat that was being used to discipline a gang member in the parking lot. And that was my glimpse to the life. When my father beat my mother with the broomstick, I felt fear. When I saw this young man get beat with a baseball bat because he broke gang code, I felt empowered. And I said, what can I do to get that respect and that power so no one will ever have their destiny in their hands, my destiny in their hands? And they gave me a glimpse. And in that moment, I wasn't part of the gang yet, but I was being lured in to the lifestyle of the lowriders and the money and the parties and the cars and the drugs and the influence. And when I saw this, you know, the OGs being respected and the the guys in the gangs that were, you know, that were gaining the the atmosphere of and the attention of everyone around there, I said to myself, whatever I have to do to get that, I want it. I didn't understand it. But they gave me love and stability that was false, but it was enough to carry me through the next day. Yeah. And I was already associated with them, but they wanted to see if I had the heart. They didn't care if I looked like one. They didn't care if I dressed like one. They wanted to see if I had the heart to be like one of them. And in my book, I detailed how I was begun. I started to get tested on if I had the heart to be a gang member. Yeah. Unconsciously, life happened fast. And I was growing up so fast that I, I didn't have enough time to even reflect what my mother was doing or my mother, she couldn't reflect because life was moving so fast in America that we lost touch, yet we were living in the same home. Yeah. It's and by the way, if I appear distracted every now and again, it's because Grace, <laughs> Grace, the rescue dog is out here. She comes to work with me uh, here in the oh, barn God. and uh, she was uh, in, insisting that I, I needed some attention or that she needed some attention, one or the other. <laughs> but uh, yeah, she so she's uh, sitting right here listening uh, raptly uh, to, your, uh. to your story. Um, th- that is something that I think a, l- a lot of people don't really understand. I mean, I was... Uh, blessed to be in a home where my parents remain married. Um, it wasn't the happiest marriage. You know, my, my dad, God bless him. The only thing he ever said to me about mom was, uh, 
you know, your mother's not the easiest person to live with. Uh, but that was, you know, as they were approaching 40 years of marriage. So, um, uh, but, you, you know, you could tell that there, there were things, there are tensions there that you don't, don't see. I certainly don't see it between you and Elizabeth or Jim and Lori, Sharon and I. You know, we, we understand that uh, from past relationships, things could be a lot different than they are. But statistics have shown consistently that even in marriages that aren't the happiest children of a home where you've got a father and a mother together uh, generally turn out to be better adjusted and less likely to turn to things like gangs, drugs, uh, pornography, and so on. And um, so I I am thankful that uh, mom and dad persevered for for our sakes. And uh, I think uh, parents who are, you know, thinking about, you know, am I in the right relationship? Well, if you've got children, uh, try to make it work if you can yeah. any way possible, because uh, as as your story is making clear, and I think this is true for a lot of kids, when you've only got one parent and the parent has to work all the time, uh, the kids are the ones who actually will wind up paying a price. Yeah. We, we even saw it with Sharon and me and, and our daughter, uh, for a while, early in our marriage, Sharon would work and uh, Nicole would go to after school care, uh, which was, you know, well run, well supervised, nice West County neighborhood in St. Louis County. Um, but we noticed that her behavior changed. Mm. And so Sharon gave up working so she could be home and provide that stability and consistency that is not there. Even if it's a family member, not a parent, but another family member who's watching the kids, it can really be a, a life changing. Um, but and and the gangs and I also talked about this with a young man named Sean Ray who uh, came out of the Chicago gang scene and uh, is now um, serving the Lord in the the Denver area. That it's the structure, it's the family yeah. that you're missing at home that the gang provides. Um, the That's question, it. and you know, I, I want to mention something about that. Because the structure is so key. Stability, structure, and purpose and consistency is what gives a young man and a young woman uh, direction. But it also gives them security. That someone has a plan for their life. And I write in my book that I didn't have a plan for my life. No one seemed to have a plan for my life. The only ones that began to have a plan for my life were the gang members and the gang culture. Now, this is so key because you don't have to be uh, a single parent or maybe you're a a person that has a a home with a wife and and a husband and vice versa. The, the, The key is this, and I tell people this all the time. I used to think that it was my responsibility to win the world for Christ. I used to think that it was my responsibility to go out and get the greatest job in the world and provide and da, da, da. And that's, Yes, in one part, it is true. But the moral, spiritual, and the gift is that I have is to walk my son and my daughter all the way up to adulthood to create a stability for them inside of their home, emotionally, physically, spiritually, be consistent with them. That's why today I am so consistent every single day, my wife and I, with our kids. There's a price to pay. Yeah, I was offered a very good, lucrative job that can pay very well, but that would take me away from my home. Yet, my wife would have been taken care of financially, my kids, you know, with the nice cars, beautiful home, and vacations, and all that. Yet, I realized if I'm away from home, then my son and my daughter are going to begin to stray away. And I saw it on myself, and I saw it with thousands of kids and millions of kids all over the world throughout the years. And one of the greatest advice Dr. Gary Smalley and Jim Baker ever gave me, Derek, was that don't go out and win the world and then come home and lose your your son and daughter. Yeah, yeah. And here I was trying to save the world, telling people about Christ and telling people about my story. And I was single, so I can do that. As a married man and as a father, I said, I cannot afford to go and win other people's kids and then come home and lose my son and my daughter. And I said, the greatest gift I can give society is to raise two great son and daughter that can contribute their gifts to society. But that means you have to pay a price. The price you can pay 
shouldn't be on the backs of your son and your daughters. You know, and I think that when I saw that in the gang, the gangs even did that. The gangs protected their own family. Their gangs protected the ability for their kids to grow up in an environment that they can see as far as they can see, but yet they were consistent with them. They were able to be there and, and be stable in their own way. It was so bizarre, but yet they gave us enough purpose that we can believe in ourselves. Yet we were messed up. I was dealing with unforgiveness, anxiety. I was dealing with depression. I was dealing with self-worth. I was dealing with all these emotions that no one ever talked about. And I think that's the difference between my wife and I in our marriage and our kids is that the key is we communicate. We have to communicate the way we, we feel. We have to have the emotions because for so long, I lived my life emotionless and I didn't have any reaction, yet I was dying inside. And there's so many men and women out in, in their families today that don't know how to communicate and they're dying. And Jim Baker said it perfectly years ago that men and women die while they're screaming a silent scream. Mm, mm. And I think that's a consequence of... Uh falling for the the uh, the devil's uh, counterfeit alternative to god's uh, divine plan uh you know created he them from the beginning male and female and uh you know the the yeah. the, the the family as defined by god has been replaced by uh the gangs by uh phone screens and and communicating via snapchat instagram or you know tiktok and and uh, other other devices. But yeah. while, while you were being drawn into the gangs, you write that your sister Laura was not. She managed to, re, she managed to <laughs> refuse and reject all of that. Yeah. And she was instrumental in changing the course of your life. You write about the three questions that changed yes. your life. What were they? Listen, this is beautiful. One, what if God is real? Two, what if prayer works? And three, that really got my attention was, what if you have a different destiny? The reason why number three grabbed my attention more than the first two is because the gangs told me every single day, Derek, not to make plans past 18 years old because I wasn't going to be alive to see past 18 years old. Wow. They had already predicted my destiny. And they said, you know, I have a tattoo here, the three dots. Yeah. And I write about them because a lot of people ask me about my tattoos yeah. and the meaning and what they mean. But the meaning of, of the three dots is the title of the book, My Crazy Life, Mi Vida Loca. You know, and, and the, the, what I write about it, I they consider the trinity of life in the streets. Prison, one of them. So most people would accomplish one out of three. Two, they would end up in the hospital. Or three, the ultimate price, of course, would be, you know, prison and death, you know, uh, but I believed them. I believed that I was going to die and that my destiny was to die for the neighborhood. Hmm. We used to have a motto. We live to die and, and die to live for the hood. So hmm. That was my, my, my destiny. I was living up for that moment. Yet when she said, what if, you, what if you have a different destiny? For me, what if you have a different destiny meant, oh, wow, I, I don't have to be dead by the time I'm 18. I don't have to live my life in prison. I don't have to, you know, live my life, you know, through the lens of what someone else is telling me. And that grabbed my attention to the point that my sister, you know, while I was building my life and my reputation and this image that I thought I was supposed to be this big gang member and, and whatnot, my sister, you know, she had a complicated growing up as well, but she was able to find her hope in going to church and find prayer and became a prayer warrior and an intercessor. I had no idea what any of that language meant, but she did tell me, I, I'm praying and I'm fasting for you. Wow. And God spoke to me that before this year is over, you're going to come to know Jesus Christ. <laughs> and your reaction, That was pretty bold. Yeah, and your reaction was as a, a dangerous gang member whose I nickname said, was Dangerous. Yeah? yeah. I said, you're crazy. I said, That's, <laughs> that would never happen. I said, I'm, I, I will never be caught in a church. I will never be caught in a prayer circle. Yet, this is the powerful thing. She was a small stature little girl, and she had the courage and the authority to walk into my world and speak to me like no one had ever spoken to me before. She didn't condemn me. She didn't send me to hell. She didn't preach to me. 
but she said, God loves you. He wants to make things right with you. I, Derek, in the gang, I was searching for peace and I was searching for love. And I was trying to do everything I can in, in, my, in my willpower. And you have to understand, anybody that is in the gang, you have to be a narcissist because only a narcissist that can live on that lifestyle and put the focus back on itself can survive in that world. Yet inside, there was a little boy inside of me wondering, why did my father leave me? Yeah. I, was, I felt abandoned. I felt confused. I felt broken. I felt like I wasn't good enough. I felt like when my father said, I don't want them anymore, then why, why am I even here in this world? Then the thought of how can a good God allow things like this to happen, and that made me even angrier towards God. I was conscious about God. I knew that there was a God, but I didn't believe that there was a God. I was fearful to find hope. I was never afraid to go to prison the rest of my life. I was not afraid to die. I was not afraid to get in a fight. Not because I was big and tough. No, it was the opposite. It was a survival mode that you live. It's that adrenaline that you live for, to just to be accepted. You're willing to go down because you want to feel like you're worth something. But yet, I was afraid of purpose. I was afraid of a good destiny. I was afraid of hope. I was afraid to find peace. Because what am I going to do with it? And sometimes most of the people in life are afraid of success. That's why they never reach for it. Because they don't know how to live their life without chaos. They don't yeah. know how to live their lives without pain, without unforgiveness. Yet people shy away from success and they shy away from having a great marriage and having a great career and going after what, you know, purpose in life. And here my sister walks in and breaks every gang code in the world <laughs> and speaks life to me. Wow. Um, I, I want to talk uh, in, in a bit about how you came into the orbit, uh, how you came to know Jim and Lori Baker, but you, you're bringing up your father. I, I want to bring uh, that back into the story um, and because this is something that you and I have in common. We both invited our fathers to be the best man at our weddings. Um I was blessed and that my dad was able to do it. How did you reconcile with your father? How long did it take? Wow. I detail in my book, and I don't want to give too much away, but I right. want you to read it because life happens in moments. And sometimes we wait for things to develop. and all that. No, sometimes life, you have to grab them in the moments that come to you. And the moment my father and I you know, reconnect. It was a moment that I walked in to get my stuff out of my mother's house because my mother had enough. My mother said, I cannot have a gang member living in my home. I cannot have a criminal living in my home. You have to leave. I don't want that in my life. And when I walked in to get my stuff out of my house, out of my mother's house, she had given everything away. She gave away my Louis Vuittons. She gave away my Jordan. She gave away <laughs> oh, my man. clothes. Man, she gave away a lot of the items that I had bought with, you know, illegal money. And yet when I walked in, the phone rings and I picked it up and it's my father on the other end. Now, this is a man you hadn't seen since the age of six. I had not heard yeah. from him. I had not seen him. And by this time, you know, I'm in my teenage years. I'm wild, man. I'm ruthless. I'm, I'm destructive. I'm, I'm, I'm a piece of garbage by this time. I had no respect towards life. I had no respect. As a matter of fact, death was around me so much that I felt like I was going to die at any moment. Therefore, I, I had lost respect for life itself. Yet at that very moment, my father and I reconnected. And we were able to have a relationship. But again, so much happened because I'll tell you this. I happened to go and see my father back in Central America for one purpose, not to get restoration, but to kill him. And I detail in my book how that took place. And yet I couldn't do it. Mm. I couldn't do it. And my father and I, you know, after I got saved and went to church and go through the discipleship program, I was still not able to forgive him. But yet we were talking. We were able to communicate. And, and as life developed, uh, my father and I began to have a friendship 
that was very uh, on the rocks. Again, we weren't able to communicate because we didn't know how to communicate at that time. If I knew now, if I knew then what I know now, I would be able to use the tools that I that I've learned to how to communicate and open up, how to humble myself back then. I didn't know humility then. Today, today I understand that humility goes a long way. Yeah. Humility, you know, breaks down, you know, unforgiveness like never before because it gives you the road map to say I'm sorry or I forgive you from my heart. And my father was not able to make it to my marriage, to my ceremony. My father was murdered, mm. you know, in front of his home. And that was one of the most devastating moments in my life. And yet one of the greatest moments because I was able to forgive my father from my heart. And I was already going to church. I was already in ministry. Yet there was something that I was holding on to that I couldn't let go. And in that moment, I learned to forgive my father from my heart. And, and my book is detailed how that came about. Even the fact that I was getting married was a miracle because I didn't believe in marriage. I didn't believe in having kids. And a lot of my homeboys, a lot of my friends were having kids and getting married. They were getting locked up and the kids were being left behind. And no, no man. So the pattern was always there. But I protected myself from having kids or even getting married. And yet the miracle is that I'm married 17 years today. I have a hey. boy and a girl yeah. twin. And I even tell the story of how that happened because my wife said, uh, I want to have babies. And my first, um, we had our first date. And on our first date, I said, I'm not getting married. I'm not having kids. And I'm not marrying a Mexican girl. <laughs> <laughs> what a charmer, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. My wife said, well, I'm getting married. I'm having kids. And I am Mexican-American. So if this doesn't work out, too bad for you. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> you know, well, you know I, I see the... Uh... <laughs> It's not just the social media posts, because you know as well as I do that uh, we can all create like a fake reality for the rest of the world on social media. But just having seen you and Elizabeth together yeah. and uh, Mateo and Mila, uh, it's it's uh, amazing. And the story of their birth, which was not an easy one for Elizabeth, is is really remarkable. Um, but uh, I, I think one of the big takeaways from, from this and from my own life and just, you know, as I get older and, and begin to have a little more understanding of my dad and my dad's life and... Uh, is is how important the influence of a father is on sons especially, but daughters as well. And uh, I know that uh, you are providing a, a really rock-solid foundation for both Mateo and Mila. Uh, Jim Baker, yeah. at some point in your life, you stumbled across the path of Jim Baker, and now you've been with him for... Decades. 26 years 26 years i thought i remembered the number but yeah. i don't want to yeah it was we, uh we the, celebrated the, 26 years uh two days ago how did that happen and what kind of influences jim had on your life oh man this is so wild because i was reading you know i wrote a chapter about jim in my book called who is jim baker it seemed like the whole world knew who Jim Baker was except me. <laughs> yeah, you know, my yeah. homeboys knew him, you know, but right. I was too caught up in my, in my gangster world that I had no idea who Jim Baker was yet. I was by this time I had already started serving at the dream center with pastor Tommy Barnett and Matthew Barnett. And I detail in my book that me serving at the dream center was a miracle because he was the gang territory of one of my enemies in the gang world. Oh. And they made my life hell. And, but yet I detailed how God made a miracle to engage with the leader of that gang. And God used me to save his mother's life. And then eventually, you know, his brother became a pastor. And the, wow. it's an unbelievable story how you can serve God in enemy's territory and still fulfill the call of God in your life. Right. And here I am trying to serve God in enemy's territory. And Pastor Tommy Barnett and Matthew Barnett entrusted this ex-gang member to drive their guest around. And one of the guests that was invited to speak was Jim Baker. Huh. And they asked me to go to the airport and pick him up and drive him back to the church because that night he was going to preach. It was a Thursday night. 
And I picked him up from the airport. And the first thing this man tells me is, I want you to take me to downtown L.A. I need to go to the L.A. mission because I need I need to go there and thank the man that runs it. And I looked at him and I said, uh, do you know what you're asking me? Because white people are not invited down there and it's a very bad situation. And he said, well, I need to go over there. And if I'm with you, I'm going to be OK. And I'm thinking, oh, boy, this is about to get interesting. And I detail in my book that by the time we got to the L.A. mission and we got out of the vehicle, all of a sudden, hundreds of people gather around asking this man for their autograph and thanking him. And I'm thinking, who is this guy? Wow. Who are you? <laughs> who, what, 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 why is all these people asking you for your autograph? Yeah. Yet we get in the car and I said, you must be famous or something. And he said, I used to be. I'm infamous. Huh. And he looked away in, in, in sadness. And I had never met anybody that walked around with so much shame like this man. And I realized I have known gang members that have been far worse than this man, yet you have been treated worse than most criminals. I said, I don't know your story, but as far as I'm concerned, Jim Baker, I said, I'm your friend. And at that time, Jim was doing a book tour with his book called I Was Wrong. Yep. And I read the book in two days, and I didn't realize it blew my mind. And Jim Baker that night preached a message that I will never forget. God can still use broken dreams with broken people. And when Jim got up there, he was a, he's, he looked like a scared little puppy. Yet when he preached, it was like he was under what the Bible calls an anointing. You know, he was under a supernatural spell, so to speak. And he turned into a different man. And he told the crowd what he got gone through and what he'd been through and how God would never walk away. And when he finished, I didn't see him till the next morning. And they were giving him a tour of the Dream Center. And I snuck in and I, I put my arm around him. And I said, Mr. Baker, I said, I've been where you've been. I said, uh, I love you, man. And that, those words, Derek, touched Jim's heart so deeply because till this day, he still talks about that moment. Wow. He said, wow. I never felt like I was loved. I felt like I was a piece of garbage. I felt like I was no good. The world said, lock him up, throw the key away. And he said, when you told me those words, it pierced my heart and I felt like I belonged. A few weeks later, dream, uh, Jim Baker moves to the Dream Center, and he becomes my next-door neighbor, and we, became, be, we began to serve the community. No one knew who Jim Baker was. Yet Jim Baker thought he was going to go there and help people, yet the people ended up helping him by healing him. And every single day, I would spend hours and hours with Jim just loving him, just believing in him. Jim was a broken man. Jim was a man that felt rejected. I detail in my book that I broke into Jim's room because after three days, I didn't see Jim around. I knew there was a problem. Jim was in, in a state of depression. Hmm. Jim was in a moment that he didn't, he didn't feel good enough to even be around broken people, yet he was broken himself. And when I walked into that bedroom, I detail it in my book. It was one of the most powerful moments I have ever encountered in my life because I saw my father in him. And I said, if someone was there for my father, I wish someone would give him life. And I told Jim, I said, man, you're in L.A., baby. You can't be in this dark room depressed. I said, we're going to go out. We're going to go shopping. We're going to go do this. We're going to do that. And there was no emotion on Jim's face. And I'm thinking, this guy's, this guy's dying. This guy is fading away. There's got to be something. This guy, I read in his book, he doesn't like sports. He loves building. He loves window shopping. And he loves people. And I'm thinking, well, him and I have nothing in common. But if that was my father, I got to do something. And I detail in my book, Derek, how I was able to get a glimpse of a smirk of emotion out of Jim. And that was the foundation to start building back up. And every single day I would spend hours with Jim about, Jim, if you had to do it again, what would you do differently? Jim, if you were ever to go back on television, what would you do differently? 
I began to ask questions and get his mind to rapidly come back into life. And, and Jim and I began to dream about going back on television and, and building Morningside and, and, and helping people and minister around the world. And, and all of a sudden, everything that we spoke back then, we are now living. We are now succeeding in, in, in the ability to live the questions that were asked even back then. And, and let me tell you something about Jim because I write about it in my book. Jim has never defended himself to me privately, let alone publicly, about his mistakes. In fact, he has, give me, he has given me wisdom. He said, hey, this is what I went through, and this is why I lost it all. I made a mistake. Hey, listen, when you get tired, don't make decisions that are life-threatening. Hey, when people come around you, watch who they are. Hey, when you feel this you know, this lust to, to go and get even with your wife because you're trying to make her jealous. Don't do that. I did it and I failed and it cost me my whole ministry. Hey, don't go around the world and save your, the world and lose your kids. I lost my own two kids, you know? So Jim has always been open and he's been open about heritage USA has been open about Jerry Falwell has been open about Jessica Hahn because I'm a kid from East LA and the only thing I knew was the truth. Yeah. And the only way to heal is by, you know, speaking truth. And little by little, I began to see Jim Baker come back to life to the point where he started dreaming again. He started believing again. Six months later, he married the woman that is now his wife, Lori Baker. And man, it was the most beautiful thing when you see someone get restored right before your eyes. But the key is you're both getting restored at the same time. Yeah, yeah. His, um, y you can see in the uh, the legacy that he's leaving, and and I'm talking about uh, the the adopted children that they brought into the ministry. Yeah. Uh, Ricky Maricela, uh, little Lori. Uh, you know, it's uh, just re remarkable, and, and others. Uh, what uh, the impact that he's had on your life. But also the the people who he has uh, helped and benefited. Of course, the corporate media never reports on that. You know, the truckloads, literally truckloads, flatbed trailers full of uh, of food that were sent to disaster areas in Florida and Texas by Morningside, um, and even other ministries that he has birthed. You know, we see uh, what uh, Zach Drew is accomplishing now uh, off on his own, uh, and uh, others who've been trained through the uh, the media school there uh, that you know the world will never know about. So um, I, my, my hat's off to you for, for speaking uh, of Jim. I had no idea. Sharon and I, Sharon had watched Jim for a long time. And after we got here, she, she saw the, the first programs that were coming from the little cafe there in Branson. I said, he's really preaching the gospel. Yeah. <laughs> All I knew of Jim Baker was what was reported by the corporate media back when yeah. I was part of the corporate media back in the late 80s and early 90s. And so, you know, I believed it. And so when Tom Horn first brought us down to Morningside back in 2015, I thought, okay, this is going to be interesting. But we trusted Tom because we'd known Tom for about 10 years at that point. And as we come to know Jim and Lori and you and the rest of the family, um, it has been truly oh. a blessing for us. Thank you. And uh, we will defend Jim. Um, I never met anybody as genuine as Jim Baker. A man that in his late 60s adopted five kids, yeah. actually nine, nine kids from the inner city of Phoenix, took them under his wing, fathered them. Uh, of course, Miss Lori Baker as well, you right. know, mothered these kids that she had been ministering to for a decade before meeting Jim. And then Jim Baker said, uh, we'll take those kids in as one of our own. And Jim has never uh, looked back on it. It's been the greatest thing that ever happened to him. And then, you know, the same kids are now running the ministry, helping. Yeah, yeah. And here we are, you know, Jim Baker, a man that, again, everyone wrote him off. Yet I will see something different behind the scenes. I said, Jim, why do you keep forgiving? Why do you keep loving these people? Why do you keep? He says, because we have to love people. You can't give up on people. You can't give up on humanity. He says, we have to keep loving every person and forgive them. He says, they only know my mistake because of what the public put out there, but they don't know the rest of my story. Right. But I can't, I can't argue with them. They, they, some people have made up their mind about Jim, and I have to be okay with that. The other hand is, 
On the other hand is Jim never stopped dreaming. He never stopped being a visionary. Here we have the PTL Voice of the Prophets Network that is reaching all around America nationwide, yet the PTL Network was gone in the 80s. It, it, that, that dream went away. Yet today, the PTL Network is back on the air, stronger than ever, growing every single day. And for a man to do it again and what God has called him to do the first time, for me, that's the greatest courage a man and a woman can ever have is to do it again and do what God has called him to do. This is what I learned about Jim Baker, man, is this. Don't fall in love with the gift that God gave you. Don't fall in love trying to chase the calling of God. Instead, learn how to align yourself with the will of God so it makes room for the calling of God and for the gifts to be shared to the world. He said, find God's will for your life. And if God's will in your life, you will find it. You, everything else will make sense in the world. Yet here we are, you know, 26 years later. I didn't realize I was going to stay for 26 years. I wasn't looking for a platform. I wasn't looking. I just wanted to be Jim Baker's friend because, to re listen, everybody needs a friend. Amen. Everyone deserves a friend. Everyone that you know, if they have a friend that can love you through the good and the bad and the ugly, that friend can allow you to dream again. That that I mean, it, it's just it's a domino effect. And one thing about Jim is that he never gave up on God, ever. And that was the greatest example is that Jim taught me how to forgive my father. Jim taught me how to forgive him from my heart. And I said, Jim, if you're able to forgive those that hurt you, then I think I'm able to forgive my father. Mm -hmm. And then God, in his miraculous, funny idea of loving you, brings a man by the name R.T. Kendall that is the guy that wrote Total Forgiveness. One of the greatest, in my opinion, I may be wrong, but one of the greatest theologians in our time. That, But more than that, he became a friend of this gang member. Mm. Jim became a friend of this gang member. Dr. Gary Smalley became a, a friend of this gang member. You know, Gary Smalley used to, you know, meet up with me to, and talk about relationships. And I'm thinking, man, I don't want to get married. He said, no, one day you're going to need it. And boy... I miss Gary Smalley so much every day in my life because their mentorship is what allows me to be here today. And I'm an extension of Jim Baker's legacy. I'm an extension yep, yep. Of, of, of what God did in his life. And here, I'm just the next gang member that fell in love with Christ. Yeah. Amen. The book is My Crazy Life, The Moments That Brought a Gangster to Grace. Yeah. I always thought, you know, coming out of uh, <laughs> Top 40 Radio as an old radio announcer, uh, La Vida Loca was just a song by Ricky Martin. <laughs> but no, it, it is a saying, and Mondo explains it in, in the book. Uh, highly recommended. It is an easy read, but it is also very powerful reading nobody is beyond God's reach. Nobody is beyond his redemption. And uh, Mondo is living proof of that. And Mondo creating a legacy of his own in uh, Mila and Mateo. And uh, we just look forward to see what the Lord has for them. Mondo, God bless you, brother. It, Thank uh, we you. look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you, sir. You can follow Mondo on the Jim Baker Show or the Mondo Show, both on the PTL Network. They've got a, they've got a free app just like we do. And it's produced by the same company, so we can highly recommend it. That's a way to get all of the content from the PTL Network and check out who is uh, joining Mondo on the Orange Couch in any given week. Coming up, ah, the censors have decided that uh, Mary Poppins, the movie Mary Poppins, 60 years old now, is no longer suitable for all audiences. You'll never guess why, bless their pointy little heads. Plus, a couple of changes in our schedule coming up for the rest of 2024. A couple of conferences that uh, have been pushed back into 2025. Tell you more about that straight ahead as a view from the bunker continues. <laughs> It's a new month, and we have a new special at the Gilbert House online store. We have a crazy, crazy deal on all of our DVDs. They are, regardless of the retail price, they are 75% off. We keep hearing from the kids these days that everything is going to streaming video, that DVDs are old school. Oh, not for us. No, we are old school. And besides, we don't trust the internet will always be there. So take advantage of this special offer. Everything from our travelogumentaries, 
basically follow us as we go through the Holy Land and show you the important site to ground zero on this supernatural war, plus video teachings, oh, yeah. presentations, and much, much more. You know, with 75% off savings on all the DVDs, as many as you want to get, you've got the money that you save to go out and buy a DVD player. <laughs> That's it. Take advantage of it now online only at the Gilbert House store, gilberthouse.org slash store. And thank you for your prayers and support. Driving the internet to think every Sunday night from the beautiful Missouri Ozarks. This is A View from the Bunker. I'm Derek Gilbert. You'll find us online at vftb.net, my website, derekpgilbert.com, and our main web hub for all that Sharon and I do together, gilberthouse.org, gilberthouse.org. On social media, X, formerly Twitter, at View from Bunker or at Derek Gilbert. You'll also find us on Facebook, the Facebook page, View from the Bunker. Truth Social, get me, we get her at Derek P. Gilbert. And on YouTube, youtube.com slash at Gilbert House. And if you're watching on YouTube, we'd appreciate it if you subscribe, click the bell for notifications, and then guarantee we never get canceled by downloading our app. The Gilbert House app is available, is free and available for iOS, Android, and Amazon Kindle Fire phones and tablets. It not only uh, brings all of our content directly to you, bypassing the gatekeepers of big tech, but it's got a really, really active messaging section. It's almost like a self-contained social media site where you can connect with other people who uh, are interested in the same things that we are, ask questions directly of Sharon and me, and uh, ask for prayer, offer prayer, share study resources, other ministry resources that uh, have been helpful to you. All of that inside the app so it's away from social media and prying eyes out there. You'll find the uh, link at vftb.net, it's in the top menu bar, or go to gilberthouse.org slash app, gilberthouse.org slash app. You'll find our store there as well, gilberthouse.org slash store. You've already heard about the uh, DVD blowout for this month, but want to tell you about the coffee. Yes, we run on coffee here at Gilbert House, and so we are proud to partner with Kevlar Joe's in offering some wonderful small-batch hand-roasted coffee uh, Nick Fisher at Kevlar Joe's has already partnered with a number of other ministries, including the uh, Camp Herman podcast, our good friend, Dr. Judd Burton. And uh, you know, for us, he is producing three and soon to be four blends. We've got a, a flavored blend inspired by Grace, our rescue dog. She's got that white blaze down the front of her black coat. And so we uh, we asked him to do a cookies and cream flavor for us. It's a very mild. It's not overtly sweet, but it's a nice mild blend. There's a snarling dachshund. It sounds rougher than it actually is, just like dachshunds. You know, they snarl and, you know, when you rub them the wrong way, but then they roll over and you rub their bellies and everything's fine. It's a Sumatran bean, medium roast, wonderful. And my favorite, inspired by this here program, Derek's Bunker Buster, that is a dark roast Colombian. And you can get beans or ground. And uh, the links are at gilberthouse.org slash store that takes you right to the Kevlar Joe's website. Well, you may have heard by now, because we keep talking about it. I've mentioned this on 5 and 10 for Skywatch TV. We discussed this on PID Radio yesterday because it just seems so ludicrous that film censors in Britain, in the UK, have decided to raise the recommended age for viewing Mary Poppins, the 1964 Academy Award winning film featuring Julie Andrews and Dick Van Dyke because of a certain word spoken by one of the characters. Well, it's not the word that you think. It's not the N word. It's, it's the H word. The H word. It's an archaic Dutch term that was used, I guess, during the Boer Wars or something. I don't know. A hundred years ago or more to apply to certain nomadic tribes in South Africa. And in the 1964 film, Mary Poppins, it's spoken by a character, uh, a retired admiral, in the uh, the British Navy, who is suffering from dementia, which <laughs> played for laughs in the film. Those of us with family members who are going through it um, know that it is not really a laughing matter, but okay, again, this is a lighthearted family comedy. It's gentle humor. The guy thinks that he's still in command of a ship. Okay, so he's an eccentric old character clearly not in his right mind, and he uses this archaic term that nobody has 
in the in the Western world is used in a, in a century. I I I, th- I thought the word referred was a German term that referred to other Germans. Sharon uh, told me yesterday she she thought the same thing. And both of us are fairly well read and fairly intelligent. We had no idea what it meant until. This ruling came out last week in the UK that said, no, no, this was a racist term used by the Dutch a hundred years ago. And it, again, it appears twice in the movie, a 1964 film from a character who's clearly there for comic relief, not in his right mind, <laughs> because no one else in the film stopped and said, you know, that's really offensive. Now it's been changed from a U rating, which means universal, everybody can watch it, to PG, parental guidance, because, because this is the world in which we live now. We look for things to offend us. Now, I will add this one one note. Uh, A very astute viewer who saw me comment on this on 5 and 10, thank you, Athena, for your note. Uh, pointed out that it is ironic that we are focusing on this one word, again, that 99% of us don't even know what it means, as offensive. And we're kind of ignoring the fact that in the film, the protagonist, the hero, Mary Poppins, is essentially a witch. Like, you know, that's okay, but, but still, still. I mean, it's a film you can enjoy with the family, you can laugh at the silliness, and not get too caught up in it. But again, the Wokarati won't let anything go. And uh, to them we say, bless your pointy little heads. The Skywatch TV virtual conference confronting the darkness is now live, and you can get instant access is what that means. It uh, will be available to sign up for for the next 90 days, but when you sign up, you get 90 days access. So the 90-day clock doesn't start ticking until you sign up for this. Sharon and I both contributed uh, presentations for it, uh, as did Tom Horn. This is Tom's last presentation. He recorded it last fall before he became ill. Rabbi Jonathan Kahn, Pastor Carl Gallops, um, Dr. Judd Burton, Messianic Rabbi Zeph Porat, Kenny C., uh, Pastor Casper McLeod, Dr. Mike Spaulding, Dr. Egal German, our good friend Vicki Joy Anderson, much more. Uh, Doug Van Dorn. I I keep forgetting to mention Doug. all available for 90 days access. This is cutting edge material, cutting edge information. And uh, you also get access as a free bonus to all six Skywatch Films feature length documentaries. So do take advantage of that. DefenderConference.com is where you go to sign up. DefenderConference.com. Now, we're just about a month away from uh, our first physical conference of the year. And we hope we see you in Dallas April 5th through 7th. And then stick around an extra day for the total eclipse on the 8th. This is the uh, Prophetic Signs in the Heavenlies Conference from Prophecy Watch. No, I'm sorry. It's uh, Hear the Watchmen. Hear the... I got my watches mixed up. Hear the Watchmen. Sharon and I will be there with our good friend, Pastor Casper McLeod, uh, David Hevner, Dr. Kerry Mayday, Dave Hodges, Michael Boldea, Paul and Heidi Begley, Colonel David Giamona, uh, Tov Rose, looking forward to meeting him for the first time, uh, John Moore, David Paxton. And Doug Thornton, looking forward to meeting him as well. This will be a a wonderful gathering, some prophetic information being shared, and of course, the total eclipse of the sun. The second part of that, the two eclipses, the 2017 eclipse and this one, that form an X near Carbondale, Illinois, if I remember correctly. So um, we hope you can join us. Streaming video is available, but uh, we'd like to see you in person at the Hilton DFW Lakes Conference Center, April 5th through 7th. Stay an extra day. Join us for the total eclipse. And uh, more information is online at hearthewatchmen.com, hearthewatchmen.com. Now, at the end of May, there was a conference I I mentioned the last couple of weeks that was uh, in the works at uh, Lake Havasu in uh, Arizona. Uh, The uh, organizer, looking at the calendar and realizing that it was less than three months out, uh, realized that, that, boy, there's a lot to do in terms of logistics to try to put together a conference. So they're actually going to target now 2025 for that. But uh, we've told them that we would love to go to Arizona, love to be a part of this. Uh, this would involve uh, Nicholas, or Nick Goss and uh, Jonathan Goss, the Gosslings from the Gosslings podcast. So uh, we hope we can uh, 
share information on new dates as far as soon as that uh, becomes available. Uh, the same holds true, by the way, for the Nephilim Anthropology Conference last weekend in October. That is also being pushed back to October of 2025, we, we think, uh, certainly being pushed back to 2025, presumably late October again. But uh, uh, again, we've told the organizer we would love to uh, be a part of that gathering because the Nephilim far from being fringe, are actually rather central to understanding the Bible and Christian theology. Because the Nephilim, the giants, the mighty men who were of old, men of renown, destroyed in the flood of Noah, those are the demons that afflict the world to this day. Their hybrid spirits were barred from the normal domain in the afterlife because they were never supposed to be. This was... The default understanding in the early church, uh, not really taught to pastors in seminary these days, but um, anyway, uh, it's a a valuable, I I think the conference would be a valuable service toward exploring this from a Christian perspective, so we hope we can take part. But again, it is off the schedule for 2024 and looking to 2025. Now, I do want to tell you about our solidarity mission to Israel. That is definitely something we want to accomplish May 6th through 13th, the first week in May. We plan to, we'd spend the entire week uh, based at a hotel in Jerusalem. Nice hotel. Uh, But uh, we would take day trips then to Tel Aviv, to Hostage Square, to the uh, exhibition based on the Nova Music Festival that was attacked by Hamas on October 7th. Then travel down to the Negev, visit Sderot, and a couple of the kibbutzim that were attacked on the 7th, to see what was done there. We would also visit then uh, the sites uh, that, as Carl Gallops would call them, uh, Ground Zero in the Supernatural War in Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, the Mount of Olives, the Western Wall. Uh, We'd also visit the Israel Museum and the Friends of Zion Museum, and uh, there would be more as well. Uh, The itinerary actually is posted at gilberthouse.org slash travel, so you can take a look at it there. GilbertHouse.org slash travel. This will be a small gathering, maybe two dozen. If we can find that many people who are interested in flying into Israel at this time, I think this would be a really powerful experience. And so we hope to pull this off. And it would be a a blessing to our friends Aaron and Eddie Lipkin, Lipkin Tours. Obviously, the economy of Israel has taken a real hit. Uh, Farmers called up, can't harvest crops. There have been volunteers going over from around the world to help with the harvesting the work that needs done while those men and women are called up by the IDF reserves. you got a population of 9 million, 1 million called up into service. The archaeologist who spent a day with us at Gilgal Refaim last March just completed 90 days in Gaza. And he's, he's not a young man anymore. I mean, he's not old. He's certainly considerably younger than me, but he's uh, not prime soldiering age anymore. That just gives you an idea of how This has affected Israeli society. You've got uh, tens of thousands of people from the northern part of the country still evacuated because it's too close to the rocket fire from Hezbollah. So we uh, we won't go to those regions, of course, but those areas that are secure, Tel Aviv, Jerusalem, those areas in the Negev, uh, and others, we would uh, definitely take you to visit, and uh, we hope you join us. May 6th through 13th, more information and a link to register at gilberthouse.org slash travel, gilberthouse.org slash travel. Thank you for taking time out of your schedule to watch or listen, wherever this may be. If you're listening at Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Amazon Music, iHeartRadio, Spotify, Spreaker, Stitcher, uh, Pandora now, or wherever else you find us, which is, of course, wherever fine podcasts are sold. Again, we thank you. Our announcer, the inimitable DC Good, and Gilbert House, uh, (laughs) A View from the Bunker is a production of Gilbert House Ministries and released under Creative Commons Attribution and Commercial No Derivatives 4.0 International License. We wrestle not against flesh and blood. Good night, Oliver, wherever you are. I'm Derek Gilbert. This is A View from the Bunker.